Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin in the name of God, the most honest, the most kind. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to God, the Lord and sustainer of all the worlds. And I greet you with a greeting of peace and mercy from the Lord. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you very much, Elisi, for this kind invitation. When uh, Anissa introduced it, she made a very, very valid point. She said, you know, at the end of the day, we're coming, but it's the people that plan and do all of the hard work that need uh, our thanks. So I, I, I went to King's, actually. Um, <laughs> and so studied um, in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and so I kind of know this stomping ground, my old stomping ground. I came out of Temple Tube Station, I was like, oh, this is so familiar. <laughs> um, and I remember doing it, well, we used to call them Islam Awareness Weeks, but I think Discover Islam Week has a better ring to it. So, and we used to sometimes check out each other's unis, making, seeing what they were doing, was, you know, are they doing better than us? Who did they manage to get? Which speakers have they got? What's their dinner like? Oh, no. It's a certain friendly rivalry between the ISOCs. But no, thank you very much to LSE ISOC for that. We've done a lot of work to get so many people here. And thank you very much for coming, because at the end of the day, it's a Friday night. You could have had so many other choices. Um, but you didn't. And so there's a reason that uh, God has brought you all here. And I pray that we all, inshallah, will speak from the heart. And I pray it reaches your hearts. And that we can, all of us, learn and grow. I, I certainly felt very inspired from the two talks this evening. And I recognize, you know, similarities and, and differences in our, in our stories. Um, so we just we discovered that I'm the oldest Muslim out of all of us, um, not necessarily in age, but uh, I think it was just uh, I took my shahada officially uh, the 4th of September 1988, so just a few days just before yours. Um, but I count I count when I became a Muslim from March of that year, because that's when I actually decided to become a Muslim. But I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. Um, I had a sort of mixture of Christiana's upbringing and then the religious upbringing. I, I grew up in a model agency. My mum owned one of the world's top model, agents, uh, model agencies. She had offices in London's New Bond Street, in Milan, in Tokyo, and in Los Angeles. And from the age of three weeks old, she took me into the office. I literally grew up um, on the floor of her agency. She was a, a, a working mum with five children, and I was the youngest, the accident. Um, <laughs> And I just went into work with her. And so everyone was beautiful. Everyone was thin and everyone was beautiful. So you're growing up as a kid and you're working out, well, okay, if everyone looks like Adonis and Aphrodite, how do I distinguish between these people? And I soon learned to distinguish them by their character, by their deeds, and by their, 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 their etiquettes towards you. If they treated you nice, if they had patience with a sort of three, four, five-year-old child, um, and, you know, they, they, they went down in my good books as good people. But if they were really sort of egotistical, total prima donnas, um, yeah, no, they, did, they just went down in the, the sort of, I don't want to speak to them category. And so I, I learned very early on that beauty, external, the externality of someone wasn't important. And so the inner dimension became very important to me from a very young age. Now, I was allowed to escape from the agency um, to my grandmother's. And my grandmother very much uh, was instrumental in my upbringing. And she's a deeply, profoundly spiritual woman. And so these attributes of always looking for the inner as a natural way, as a child, that became my, my, my way. And to be profound with this profound and spiritual and wonderful human being who was my grandmother, created a certain personality type. And so, I can't actually remember a time I didn't believe in God. I can't remember a time when God wasn't important in my life. I can't remember a time when I wasn't trying to submit to God. And I think I gave my life to God when I was a very, very tiny child. It doesn't mean I didn't make mistakes. It didn't mean I didn't go, you know, you know make, make certain mistakes or sins or anything like that. It's just I had this consciousness that I loved God with all my heart. And I wanted to love my neighbor as myself. And these are two great commandments of Jesus Christ, as he says in Matthew. Love, love your Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And these were profound influences in me. <coughs> and so I grew up as a practicing Christian from my own motivation. My family, I'm not, what is it, Wikipedia, weren't actually, um, never trust Wikipedia, it's 
got my dad's name as Joe Askin, because like, my mum's maiden name, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sure he'd be pleased, God rest his soul. Um, I had this deep and profound relationship with God, and I expressed that through my Christian upbringing. And I'm going to bring in a little 11 year old girl I met in Australia last year at this point. She stood there and she asked me, when you became a Muslim, when you remember being a Christian, did you pray to the same God? And I looked at her and I thought, wow, that's the most profound question in 23 years of actually doing this stuff. And I said, yes, my darling, because there is only one God. There is only one God. He is the God of the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims and the Buddhists and the, 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 the Zoroastrians. He's the God of everybody. There is only one God. And so whoever we pray to, it is just the one God. But eventually I, I came to this realization within myself that I wanted to serve him, and I thought that I would serve him by becoming a nun. And I thought that that's what he had destined for me. Now, I didn't want to be just any old nun, I wanted to be Mother Teresa. <laughs> um, well, it because I like the sari either. Um, but my faith was also very much limit, uh, connected to a sort of liberation theology. That Christ had come uh, to liberate people, to free, and, and he'd come to the poor, the weak, and the dispossessed. And so I felt that I wanted to live a life of service to the poor, the weak, and the dispossessed. And so the issues that were for me as an eight-year-old child were things like South Africa. Uh, were things like uh, nuclear weapons. These were the big issues of the day, and they were the things that concerned me. There were things about poverty. So I grew up in Chelsea, and I can still remember standing on the corner of Sloan Square, um, and a Rolls Royce went past, and I just sort of stamped my foot, and how many people, how many poor people could you feed with that car? My mum's sort of like, yeah, okay. And sort of going into the, the Safeway supermarket on the King's Road and storming and asking them, why do you only have South African apples? Don't you realise I can't have, I can't buy South African apples? And I must have thought, where the hell did this eight-year-old child come from? Uh, precocious or what? I suppose I, I was. And these were the things that drew me, sort of social action and my faith. And then my brother, when I'm about 13, 14, something like that, he falls in love with a beautiful Indian girl in Gujarat and basically converts to Islam for this love of a woman. And I think that he sold himself to the devil for the sake of a woman. I, like, I, cannot, I can remember the feeling. I found out about that he converted when I was going to Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong in the hotel lobby and his future sister-in-law, his future wife's sister, sort of talks to me and says, oh, Secunda. And I'm like, who on earth is Secunda? <laughs> and uh, she goes, what? Well, it's Trevor. Don't you know he's converted to Islam? It was like, uh, no, I didn't know. And I want to know why. And, and it was a bit this, had a slight, slight marginal nervous breakdown. Because all my family knew I would have a slight marginal nervous breakdown. They decided not to tell me. Um, and I can still remember the great relief the morning after his wedding. We're sitting down to breakfast. And eggs and bacon come. And the egg and bacon turns up, and my brother tucks into it, you know, grabs the plate. And my mum's like, you can't eat that, it's, you're a Muslim now. And he's like, yeah, and give me that. <laughs> and I can remember this relief, actual relief. I didn't have a very good image of Muslims. Muslims, for all I knew, I didn't know what they worshipped. They had something to do with a black box in the Middle East. I got squashed between two Arab women, all wearing black, in Marks and Spencers when I was about five. They both went down simultaneously, and I got squashed. Um, and it had something to do with Palestinians and uh, blowing aeroplanes and hijacking aeroplanes. This was all my image. You know, so the stereotypes really haven't changed in uh, 24 years. And so I didn't have I, I, I was gobsmacked. And my mum says to me, recognising that I had slight problems, just a few issues, you do know that Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. When I was like, no, I don't know that. And I wasn't sure I believed her. But I was a studious type of lass, and when I was in the library, I picked up the Quran, opened it up, index, Jesus, Jesus, born of virgin, read Surah Ali Imran. It's almost identical to, to the Gospels. And I was like, well, at least they've got something right. Close book. <laughs> anyway, we haven't got enough time to go through all the stories, so in a truncated version, Ultimately what happened was I kept, I didn't keep studying Islam at all at that time, I studied Christianity. And to all 
my Christian, who anybody is a Christian in the audience, but the first thing I'm going to say is proceed what I'm about to say with the verse from the Quran. And it says, and argue not with people of previously revealed revelation, bar those who are bent on denying the truth, or bar those who are bent on, on evil, but rather say unto them, we believe in that which was revealed unto you, and that which was revealed unto us, for our God and your God are one and the same, and unto him do we surrender ourselves. Right? But this is my journey as a Christian to Muslim. And I loved being a Christian. Loved it. I loved the smell of the church. I loved the liturgy. I loved the mass. I loved, I loved the hymns. I was at a funeral the other day. I love it. But I would not take my religion for my God. And I lost my faith in the Christian church, in my church. I was a Catholic. And it had, I was studying its history for my history A levels. And I realized it had a history that I couldn't personally accept in my personal journey. And I lost my faith. And it was very, very difficult. And I went along to the church and I said confession. And my priest was wonderful. And he said, don't worry, my child, you'll be a great Christian. Don't worry, you'll be a fine Catholic. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't right. Um, but he was very sweet. At the same time, I was studying Islam. And the thing with it is he kept answering the questions. And it was like the same, but different. And so you've got the story of Adam and Eve, and I can't do that much theology in, in, in the next four minutes or five minutes. But you've got Adam and Eve. And there's the fall, and there's the... There's the tempting, and there's the tree. But they're both mutually responsible. And then, so you think, hey, Eve wasn't framed here. Yeah, it wasn't all Eve's fault after all, you know, and that's why we have to bear childbirth and pain and agony and menstrual cycles, all of that, because, you know, Eve was the temptress. And that was great as a woman. Hey, Adam was equally responsible. And the beautiful thing is also that God forgave them. And that our time on earth is just so that we may come to grow. And so that was an issue. Things like the story of Noah. And it seems like a silly point. But Noah, he gave people the choice to get on the boat. It wasn't that he was, him and his family were chosen. But he, he, he made a choice. He, he called people, come on the boat, come on. I'm warning you. I know I sound like a crazy person, but come on. He gave people the choice. And so people could have that choice. And we're going to come to choice right at the end. And then in relation of Jesus, peace be upon him. I love Jesus. He was, you know, he was one of the people of my life. My mum, my grandma, and Jesus. There were three people in my life. And I think as a Muslim, I still love him. But I had the opportunity to love him, I believe, as he really was. And that is as a prophet of God born of a virgin through the power of God, as an example of God's power rather than Christ's divinity. Because God can just do anything. He just says, couldn't get be, and it is. And the parable of Jesus is that of Adam. You know, if we think that Jesus was a miracle because he was created without man, then Adam was a miracle because he was created without a man or woman. And it was the idea that Christ wasn't divine, but he was a beautiful, wonderful, prophet of God, born of virgins through the power of God. And I was, I was so close to being a Muslim. So close. I, I had lists. Yeah, I believe this. I believe this. Yeah, yeah, okay, I believe that. And you know, it was like everything. And I, and I ticked it. But I didn't want to be a Muslim. Really. I just lost one faith. I didn't really want to grab another world faith and lose that one. And so I continued to study Islam. But it was, you know, a little bit of distance, please. But because I'd surrendered my life to God when I was very little, I was talking to him all the time. I chat to God. I think, I think actually the constant conversation is a great conversation. Don't be rigid about it. Talk to him all the time. Yeah, you say your salah and you go into that. But also talk all of the time. Hello, things are a bit problematic down here. Uh, some help with the bonus. You know, have that relationship, but also the relationship of, of awe and mercy when you see the you know, the sunset and you're subhanallah. You know? Little by little. And then I go, I sit, my friend calls me up, and she said, do you want to come to this event? It's one of the mosques. So I said, yeah. 
So first guy I end up with a house in Battersea. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so this is the mosque. Now, churches for me were like big buildings, and here was the mosque, and I was like, okay. And we go up a tiny, narrow staircase, and I go into a room filled with Pakistani women in Shawar Kameez, none of them really speaking English, listening to a talk that came in on an overhead speaker by a man whom I couldn't see, with a woman, and I remember this vividly, rocking back and forth with a baby, and she kept whacking the baby, so the sort of baby was being put to sleep, and she kept going, pop, pop, pop. and I was like really shocked. I mean, talk about culture shock. It's a massive culture shock. I was looking around thinking, where have I come? Anyway, the guy gives this speech, and it wasn't a bad speech. I don't remember anything bad. He sort of said something like, Islam is in Britain because we have the National Health Service and, and things like this, and so these very good values of Islam um, are actually evidence within Britain. And I was like, oh, that sounds very nice. He doesn't, doesn't hate my country. That's a relief. Um, and then, that was it, went down, she said, I've got to do some washing up, so will you hang around? Yeah, I said, okay, I'll hang around. She said, so I gave her a hand, and she went, and she said, I'm just going to say my prayers. Now, she wasn't exactly spot on all of the time with her prayers, but this particular day, this particular Asa prayer, she didn't miss it. And she stood there, and for all of my studying, and for all of my books, I'd never actually seen anybody pray. And she stood there, and she bowed, and she stood again, and then she went down into prostration. Her head, the thing we hold aloft, she was putting it on the floor in worship of her Lord, in awe of God, the one, the uncaused cause of all creation, the sublime, the merciful, the guide, the light. She put her head in prostration on the floor and I thought, that, that is surrender. The thing I had wanted to do all my life, the thing I had been trying to do all my life, to surrender utterly to God, she did it. It was what we would call as a Catholic, an outward sign of inward grace, an outward sign of what I had been trying to achieve all my life. And I knew then and there, it was March 1988, three months before my 17th birthday, and I knew I would become a Muslim. And I decided at that moment that I was a Muslim. And from that point, I fasted and I used my hajiba. It's all very nice coming and listening to these stories. They're just our stories, our journeys. Each one of you has a journey from birth to death. But this very short time, as the Prophet has survived, is just like stopping the shade under a tree. It is the life, the life of the hereafter. That is life, if we but knew it. In this tiny journey, just written in my editorial, it's called the dash. You know you see on gravestones from the beginning to the end, there's a little dash, a hyphen in the middle. That's our life. From the birth to the death, that, that dash is our life. Is that dash, is your dash going to be a life of surrender? Surrender utterly. Surrender utterly. And number two. You've all come here to listen to four people talk about their journey to surrender. Because that's what Islam means. Their journey to surrender. Their choice. Oh, you're better than us. We, you chose Islam. How many times have I heard that in my 24 years? My dearest brothers and sisters, every single human being has to choose. Are you going to choose to lead a life of surrender in worship of your Lord or not? Are you going to live a life of kindness to your fellow human beings because of your surrender to the one true God or not? Are you going to give your life to him, to surrender utterly or not? The choice is for each and every one of us. The fact that we're here from MTV and Covent Garden and model agencies makes our choice seem stark. But it's the same for all of us. 
We all have a choice. And are you going to choose to surrender? Jazakallah, happy for time and your attention. I think I've said if any good is from Allah, the mistakes they must certainly learn. Assalamu alaikum.